Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7. And um, concerning last Sunday, I taught two lessons on prayer and fasting. I'm going to try to uh, re-record those this week uh, up in the top secret broadcasting studio and uh, get those out for people. I think it's a good teaching. I think people, it'll bless them, it'll help them. I've already had some people call for it. I announced it Tuesday that we would have it on DVD and uh, Lindsay showed me the recordings. One of them's completely without sound. So anyway, uh, I'm gonna try my best to get those ready for everybody this week. Appreciate your prayers, appreciate your love and your support. Genesis chapter 7, um, back up a little bit and sort of get uh, where we were going to go last Sunday. And um, I'm going I'm to do something. Is everybody warm or is it just me? Not to a woman. It's, yeah, it depends on the woman though. Some of them freeze and some of them burn and I've only got access to one air conditioner in here and it's on. John, can you turn that one on over there? Turn it down a little bit so it runs. Um, and let's see here. There we go. Uh, a couple Sundays ago, we kind of started covering this a little bit in uh, Genesis chapter 7, looking at the, the symbolism of the flood. Uh, and what it, what I believe it points to concerning what is going to happen in the last days. Uh, I quit following people's charts years ago. Um, I used to have it memorized, used to have it down pat. This, this is going to happen here, this is going to happen here, this is going to happen here. And uh, when I look for scripture to back the charts up, I don't find them. And, uh, of course, that's an argument in itself. Some would say it's there. You're just not seeing it. I say I'm not seeing it because I'm not seeing it. It's not there. And, uh, but it's, you know, whatever. Uh, God's going to do what he's going to do, whether we give him the approval or not. Okay? If any one of us thinks he can correct God, then we've got another thing coming. So Genesis chapter 7. Remember what Jesus said. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Uh, for as in the days of the Son of Man, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Until the time of the flood came, took them all away. Noah, we've already, we've already discovered that Noah and his family had to know. Because Noah told them what God had said. God told Noah for yet seven days and I will destroy the earth. So it gives him a time frame to build the ark. Then God waits. God's patient. God's not in a hurry. God's got it all figured out what he's going to do. When the last animal went on that ark, or the last two, the last two centipedes crawled up, last two butterflies flew in, the last two chickens showed up, and uh, the last two bunny rabbits uh, went in there. Then Noah and his family moved in. That way, they waited seven days. I believe they were in that ark seven days. They waited patiently on the Lord. And God did exactly what he said he was going to do to the day that he said he was going to do it. His timing was right on. No one in his family knew. And I'm sure that anybody else, I am positive that anybody else who wanted to be in there could have gone in there. Noah preached to them. Told them about it. They didn't believe him. So God shut the door of the ark. Closed it up. At that moment, they hear rain dropping, and they, the earth probably shook, because we have two sources, remember that, two sources for the water. The 600 year of Noah's life, and the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day where all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. We talked about that a little bit uh, a couple weeks ago. The significance of the 40 things that happened in 40s in the Bible. Uh, some people kind of thought that, I don't know, the time, timing of the, 
announcement of the lockdown, the quarantine, 40 days, something was going to happen, nothing happened that I'm aware of. Uh, so that, but that's what I heard, though. Some people like to count things and say, well, is this going to happen? And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So anyway, we'll go to the Lord and ask for guidance. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for a perfect Bible. We are imperfect beings. And Father, if the world is counting on us to deliver the truth, uh, God, we're not capable of it. You're the, you're the only one that's always true, and you never lie. So, Father, we are very thankful for this Bible. It is perfect. It is right. Its words do not need corrected. Its words are there to correct us. So, Father, open our eyes and help us to see marvelous things out of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. Uh, windows of heaven. I don't know if I touched on that. Um, go to uh, Malachi. May, I may have, but it's the place, yeah, I did, I remember that. It's the place in the Bible where you find out there's, there's windows of heaven and what God said. Verse 8 of chapter 3, Malachi chapter 3, last, last page or two before you get to the end of the Old Testament. Uh, Malachi chapter 3, verse 8, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, but you say, wherein have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings? So he said, you're cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. And what does he mean by that? God blessed Israel on the basis of their obedience. If they obeyed, he blessed them. If they disobeyed, he didn't bless them. Plain and simple. And so when people didn't obey God, let me look at what it says. Uh, For ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. What you've done is they robbed the entire nation of God pouring out his blessing on them. Because they were disobedient. So they robbed God. The, the purpose of the offerings and the tithes that they gave was su- the support of the Levite priest, support of the ministry, the kingdom of God. And uh, when, they, when they did that, the Levites were blessed. Everybody was blessed. There was an, there was an overabundance. Study the days of Hezekiah. Uh, I haven't preached on that, taught on that in a long time. Study the days of Hezekiah. In the days of Hezekiah, there was revival. Hezekiah did not tell everybody, you better get right with God. Everybody started getting right with God. And everybody started bringing in all these offerings. Bread offerings, lambs, goats, and all kinds of food and everything like that. Offering it as sacrifice to God. And they had so much, the Bible said, they didn't know what to do with it. They had storehouse. They built it up and stuffed it everywhere. Okay, Kind of like a submarine when they're fixing to go out. They shove food everywhere in these submarines. So that's what happened. Lo and behold... Uh, who was it? Sennacherib came with his army, surrounded Jerusalem. And the king said, close the gates. And the purpose was of surrounding the city, you're cutting them off. Cutting them off from supply chain. Okay? What Sennacherib didn't know was, they had it all inside. Even the well. They said, king, there's a well that's running outside of the city, and uh, it's watering our enemies. Hezekiah said, plug it up. I ain't about to give them any of our water. So they plugged it up. So who's going to starve here? Snacker bit his armies. The longer they wait, the worse it gets. They had plenty inside of there. And that's the way God does it. God, God prepares. Even when we don't know what's coming, don't worry about it. Okay? Let, let God have it. So anyway, he said... Um, Verse 10, bring you all the tithes in the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house. Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven. There it is right there. So think about it. Again, what killed the earth saved the saints? Water. The ark is only good if it floats. Okay? So God did what he said. He blessed Noah by opening up the windows of heaven. That lifts him up higher. Think about anytime something goes up in the Bible, that's good. Okay? Anytime something goes down, that ain't good. So that, I just kind of think about that. And then uh, notice the two sources of the water. It came from underground. Fountains of the great deep were broken up. The earth shattered. 
and released all this water, to, which science says is under there. Science says there's a vast amount of water under our feet, huge amounts, a whole ocean. And then the windows of heaven were opened. So we get this idea before the flood that the earth was covered with a vapor canopy. The, canopy. the Bible says there was a mist come up from the ground. It never rained. It didn't have to. Because the earth was watered from underneath. Every plant put its roots down, had plenty of water, so much water that a mist, a fog, came up from the earth constantly. Well, where's that water going to go? Up. Canopies the entire earth. And what it does, it makes most of the planet temperate. Meaning that up in Norway, Denmark, northern Canada, Antarctica, evidence, fossilized tropical plants, fossilized tropical plants up above the Arctic Circle, below the Antarctic Circle. What does that mean? It means that at one point, most of the earth was a common temperature. Okay? So what happened? We don't know. Maybe a meteorite hit. We know there's one that hit a big one in the Gulf of Mexico near the Yucatan Peninsula. We know it, we know it happened. So imagine what would be the effect of a giant, I mean huge, Meteorite smashing into the earth, breaking up the, the, the whole fabric of the earth, and then rocking all of that moisture that's up in the air. Tons, billions and billions of tons of water up in the air. All coming down at once. Okay, And that's a biblical word. Okay, So it came down, it came up. Revelation 9, we have our enemies... Coming up from the pit. They're rising up like a locust plague and they cover the earth like a flood. That's Revelation 9. So I'm not going to read all this because we did it a couple Sundays ago. Then Revelation 12. A multitude of fiery devils. Cast out of heaven, falling to the earth like fire and brimstone. It rained fire. It rained fire on Sodom, Gomorrah, two other cities. Rained fire and brimstone upon Egypt. It's a picture, it's a foreshadow. It's a picture. So we have those two events. We have it rising up from the earth, have it falling down from heaven. Revelation 9, Revelation 12. Look up on the screen. The other, our enemies speak a different language than us. They speak a language of symbols. So that you do not know what they are saying. They hide what they're saying in a mystery. And you might say, well, symbols mean anything, right? Well, that's the point. They're never static in their meaning, constantly changing, okay? But if you take a close look at it, and I've shielded some of Baphomet, okay? This is church. But notice there, one's pointing up, one's pointing down, okay? Same with Baphomet. He's got one arm raised, one arm lowered, okay? That's opposites. He's both man and beast. He's angel and human mixed together. Look at his two hands. This was Eliphas Levi. He was a 19th century occultist. Back when you got Eliphas Levi, you got uh, Helena Blavatsky. You've got sort of a French occult revival spreading all throughout Europe. You have a cult revival in America, the late 1800s, after the Civil War. You have that going on. It just seemed like the devil's running everywhere, and he's stirring up people. 
and they're concocting all these uh, rituals. They're, they're delving into the ancient magic practices. They're forsaking Christianity. And they're moving into the occult. So Elipheus Levi drew this by inspiration. A, he was guided as he drew the symbolism. And there's multiple symbolism on it. So he makes a hand gesture on one hand like this. And then the opposite hand like this. Okay? So the hand itself is a number. What number is it? One, two, three, four, five. Okay? So it represents something related to the number five. Transformation. Like the rapture. Okay? The two fingers pointing down refer to the lower part of the earth. The three fingers pointing up refer to what? Heaven. And they're joined together the same hand. Who was a Boy Scout? Anybody a Boy Scout? Was you? Does that look familiar? Okay. That's how they took their oath. Germans. I don't know why. I don't know where it came from. But I've seen enough World War II vintage film to know that when a German soldier or a judge or an officer of any kind swore an oath, he made that symbol. I got various pictures of it. Okay. Uh, salve and coagula are the two words tattooed on his arm. Salve means dissolve. Coagula means coagulate, bring back together, group. So the idea is, and, and I want you to ponder this, you can't build a new world while the old world still exists. You must destroy the old world. It has to be dissolved. So then you can rebuild a new order in its place. And that idea is actually biblical. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. So it's a, it's a flip opposite of God's idea. And I see this symbol everywhere. Okay? Movies especially. It is deliberate that they do this. And in some cases, you can obviously tell they were directed to do it. Often you'll see people, when they raise their hand, they kind of do like a lazy hand raise. Okay? Well, people do that all the time. Okay? But like right here, um, this is from Tomb Raider. This was the secret sign between her and her lost hidden daddy. Okay, that finger sign. This is Mulan, the movie. Okay, that's done deliberate. Um, this is from the movie Australia, and she's telling the, the little boy that he has magic. And she uses this symbol. Okay, uh, who is this? What movie is that from? Doctor Strange. So how did, how did they all do their magic in Doctor Strange? They always used this gesture to do it. Always. This is uh, Tom Hanks playing the Dan Brown's character, Robert Langdon. And he's explaining like Mary Magdalene and Jesus. They were the polar opposites in Da Vinci's painting of The Last Supper. And he's, he's being directed to do this. Okay, It's obvious to me. That he's making this in a deliberate fashion. All right? So I'll move on from there. Now, let's go to the Psalms. So we have witnesses. We have, we have an event that we know is going to take place, Revelation 9. And we have an event that we know is going to take place, Revelation 12, Revelation 6, Matthew 24, Joel 2, Acts 2. We know it, Isaiah 13. We know it's going to take place. Okay? So now, Psalms always... Now, I'm going to be honest with you. If I look for a sort of a definition of a symbolic word in the Bible, my first target is always Job, Psalms, and Proverbs. Always. I'll go there first before I go anywhere else. Because they seem to be the dictionaries of the Bible. Seem to explain what a certain idea or concept 
would mean. And it kind of links you with the Old Testament types, New Testament prophecies. Psalm 18.4, the sorrows of death can pass me and the floods. Now he's going he's gonna to link it together. He's actually going to tell you that the last day floods is not going to be water. It's going to be ungodly men. Okay? Ungodly men. Are there more lost people than there are saved people in this world? You bet. Oh, you bet. There's even more lost people in the church than there are saved people. Okay? In churches, I'll say. So, you get this idea, because God promised that he was not going to flood the earth with water ever again. He's going to keep that promise. But God said as it was in the days of Noah. Jesus said that. So, that he can't flood it with water, he'll break his promise. What's he going to flood it with? Ungodly men. Psalm 32, 6. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely. Underline that word, surely. In the floods of great waters, they shall not come nigh unto him. In fact, turn to Psalm 32. What is, that? What is the context of that? What is the reference to it? Psalm 32 starts out with the gospel in the first two verses. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, one. Whose sin is covered, two. Blessed is a man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, three. And in, the whose spirit, in whose spirit there's no guile, four. Four things there. Blessed is salvation. To be blessed is to be saved. And then he says, when I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all, all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledge my sin unto thee and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. See la, for this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Verse 7, for thou art my hiding place. You're my ark. You're my ark, Jesus. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. That's why we sing songs of deliverance. Amen. Uh, Psalm 69. Turn there. Psalm 69. Amen. I sink in deep mire. Verse 2. In fact, let's go to where? Oh, look. Got to go to verse 1. Get the context. Save me, O God, for the waters are come in unto my soul. What kind of waters? Ungodly. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I'm come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. You ever been there? I'm weary of crying. My throat is dried. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. They hate me without a cause and are more than the hairs of mine head. They that would destroy me, being mine enemies, wrongfully are mighty. Then I restored that which I took not away. So he's telling you the enemies. His enemies are the flood of great waters coming over him, overpowering him. What is said of the beast in Revelation 13? He maketh war with the saints. And what does he do with them? Overcomes them. That's a little scary. Okay. So... Understand it like this, like in Ezekiel 38, when God talks about Gog, the chief prince, how Gog is up in the north, he doesn't want to come down to invade Jerusalem, but God puts a hook in his mouth, drags him down there, causes him to invade his people. He's using his people for bait, right? Using them for bait, like he did with the Israelites. When Pharaoh went, what did I do? Why did I let them all go? So Pharaoh said, I'm going to go kill them. So God held Israel right at the Red Sea, used them for bait. And the thing that saved Israel destroyed Pharaoh and his armies. Again, and what did God do it with? Water. Okay? I mean... Think of baptism. You're passing through the waters. Not over the top of them. There's no bridge. 
We don't have anybody step over the baptistry. See, that represents he's saved. No, go through it. Amen. Uh, Psalm 90. Oh, Psalm 90 is good. Psalm 90. I love Psalm 90. And 91. Let's look at Psalm 90, verse 1. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction, and sayest, Return, ye children of men. For a thousand years, here's God's time pattern. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday, when it is past and as a watch in the night. A day is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. Verse 5, Thou carriest them away as with a flood. There it is. They are as asleep. They that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunk, drunken in the night. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others. In the morning, they are like grass which groweth up. Uh, in, the flour in the morning, it flourisheth, verse 6, and groweth up. And in the evening, is cut down and withereth. For we are consumed by thine anger and by thy wrath are we troubled. You can just keep on reading, 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 reading. I don't know if I mentioned this, but, I mean, you'll get, I mean, there's more in Psalms that I'm not taking the time to give you. But do you remember how many days the waters prevailed? In other words, how many days they kept going up? 150. How many Psalms are there? Okay. One a day. For 150 days. Because when the water starts going back down, Noah and his family are going, Oh, thank God. Land. Psalm 93. Turn there. Verse 1. The Lord reigneth. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength. Wherewith he hath girded himself. The world also is established that it cannot be moved. Thy throne is established of old. Thou art from everlasting. Meaning God always was, is, shall be. So he's from a place where time is not linear. We don't understand that. But that's how it is. There is no passage of time. Where God is. He is from everlasting. He's from a place, literally, that is, is not governed by the limitations of time. We are. In eternity, if I said something and I wanted to unsay it, I could go back and unsay it, I guess. I don't know how that works. It's going to be fun to play with it, though, for a million years. Amen? All right. Um, verse 3. The floods are lifted up, O Lord. The floods are lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their what? Verse 3, Psalm 93. Their waves. Okay, now think about that. Uh, if you've ever done any study in like the New Age. Or ever been part of the New Age. Maybe at one time. Have you ever heard anybody talk about frequencies? Okay? So, when you listen to these New Agers, they talk about these ascended masters who are the guardians of the universe. They're the wise sages, and they live nearly infinite lives. And they have at one time lived on this earth. Jesus is one of them. Buddha is one of them. Okay, you have all these ascended masters, like angelic beings. What they're ours, they're devils. They're familiar spirits. And they talk about how the only way that you can get in contact with them is for your vibration, vibrational frequency, to be elevated to theirs. Okay? So I, I'm reading all that, and I'm going, that's a bunch of garbage. Okay? That's nonsense. Because when I pray to God, I don't have to tune my vibrational frequency. I just cry. 
Okay? That's what they say. So I got to think about that. I'm going, what are frequencies? Waves. The frequency means the frequency of each top of each wave. How many times the top of the wave passes a certain point? Okay? That's the frequency. Radio waves, microwaves, TV waves, all kinds of waves. Cell waves, they all have frequencies. So it's like when you hear the UFO people, and I'm going to release another video tonight, when you hear the, the UFO people talk, for some reason, in or, the only way to contact aliens is to chant OM. Now, think about this. We are an advanced technological society, are we not? We communicate in ways that 150 years ago and before that, no one ever communicated in such a way, like radio, CB bands, CB radios, uh, cell phones, internet, right? So we communicate in advanced methods. Do we not still know how to write stuff on paper? I mean, we had gotten so advanced, and yet we still know how to do things the old way. Write it down. Right, JR? Write it down. So these aliens, they say, are so advanced, they don't know how to communicate with us on our level. Fooey. They're not Martians. They're devils. They're beasts. They're beasts. And there's only certain ways you can speak to beasts. Amen? Amen? So that's what that means. And then you just go through all the Psalms. Read all 150 Psalms. You're going to see it's all about water, God's wrath, God's judgment, God saving sinners from that judgment. And near the end of the Psalms, you get into the praise Psalms. Everything's praising God. Praising God for everything. All right? That's the pattern you have. It's Isaiah 28, turn there. Isaiah 28, woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower. That song, Delta Dawn, Reminds me of that. Delta Dawn, what's that flower you got on? Is, could it be a faded rose of days gone by? You don't remember that song? I don't want to sing it. Because it'll get stuck in your head. Okay? There's, but it's like, and the song is about this, this woman who met this good looking handsome man. He gave her a rose. And she thought, boy, we're going to be together for the rest of our lives. Next morning, he's gone. But she's still carrying around that old rose. Okay, and that's all she's got of that relationship. That's Ephraim, the drunkards of Ephraim. All they have is the days gone by, the fading flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. Look at verse 2. The Lord, behold, the Lord hath a mighty and strong one. And this is not Christ. Okay, I think it's Antichrist. The Lord hath a mighty and strong one, which as a tempest of hail and a destroying storm. Remember what fell on Sodom and Gomorrah, fire and brimstone, what fell on Egypt. Fire and brimstone, hail, fiery hail. And as destroying storm. If you want to write in where it says destroying storm, if you have a way to write in your Bible, uh, things that come to mind are Ezekiel 13. And I think Ezekiel 24, where he talks about the prophets and the priests, they're building with untempered mortar. And the untempered mortar is, they're saying that God said it, and God said, I never said it. So he said, I'm going to send a tempest and a storm, and the overflow, and the hail is going to pound down that wall, and your foundation is going to be discovered. It's going to be found out what you built this on, you didn't do it right. So, a tempest of hail, back in verse 2, and a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth with the hand. With the hand. Verse 3, the crowd of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, shall be trodden under 
feet. And the glorious beauty which is on the head of the fat valley shall be a fading flower and the hasty fruit before the summer, which when he that looketh upon it seeth, while it is yet in his hand, he eateth it, it up. Now, think, I want you to think about something for a minute. When I read this here, it said that it should be trodden under feet. When Jesus was given the Beatitudes. He then followed it up by saying, you are the salt of the earth. And if the salt hath lost its savor, wherefore shall it be salted? It is what? Good for nothing to be cast out and trodden under the feet of men. Now think about it. The churches, all the churches in America caved to the government telling us don't go to church. Now, we did that for a couple weeks, and then we said, we're done. But not all the churches are back meeting again. I don't want to judge anybody, okay? But the, we never thought we would ever see the day when the government would tell the churches, you don't have church, and the churches said, okay, Okay, now at the time we were told it's a bad thing. We got We got to keep everybody apart. We're now seeing that may not quite be so. Okay, so yeah, I, I guess maybe, I don't know, maybe we didn't do right. I don't know. But once we realized it, we got back together and God bless all the churches that decided the government doesn't tell the church what to do. It's against the constitution for the government to prohibit the free exercise thereof. It's not allowed for the government to tell the church when they can have service. It's not allowed. All right. So anyway, just thought I'd throw that in. And then, of course, Isaiah 28 in uh, verse 7. They have erred through wine, through strong drink or out of the way. Wine and strong drink are always equal false doctrine. Always. So a person has a false doctrine spirit in them. They're never going to believe the Bible right. Never. They're never going to preach it right. Never going to teach it right. They're always drunken and they don't see the way. They can't stand. They fall. They spew out vomit, but there's the dogs in the pews lapping it up, okay? Uh, they swallowed up of wine. They're out of the way. Jesus said, I'm the way. They're out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They can't see. You can't see what the Bible says. They stumble in judgment. They don't understand the difference. God told the priests, don't drink wine or strong drink when you go and do your service in the temple because you won't be able to tell the difference between clean and unclean. Between holy and unholy. Between sacred and profane. So you got churches meeting in hooters, restaurants, meeting in bars, or pastors using foul language during the sermon, telling his people that the service is PG-13. If you got kids oh, uh, younger than sixth grade, they cannot be in here. Because I'm going to say some things. Kind of fruit. Well, I'll tell you what kind of fruitcake that is. He was a drunk, a literal drunk. He had to step out of the ministry because he got caught being a drunk. He was, had, was an alcoholic, had to go in treatment. Okay? And, but he still defends himself. So anyway, for all tables, verse 8, are full of vomit, filthiness. There is no place clean. And then God says, whom shall he teach knowledge? God's looking for people he can talk to. Amen. Now turn to Isaiah 59. Just be glad. Just be glad and thankful. Don't be arrogant. Be glad and thankful that God can talk to you. Amen. Isaiah 59. Let's see here. Where are we going to start? Oh, look at. Oh, this is good. Look at verse 16. Isaiah 59. Uh, and he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him, his righteousness, it sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate. That's what Paul said. 
Where did Paul get it from? Here. The helmet of salvation upon his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. They call us religious fundamentalists. And zealots. Yes, sir. Hoorah. Amen. God and country. According to their deeds, according he will pay, repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, to the islands he will pay recompense. Verse 19 is what I have up on the screen. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun when the enemy, not if, when the enemy shall come in like a flood. The spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And the standard is what you're holding in your hand. The Redeemer shall come to Zion and unto them that turn from transgressions. And Jacob saith the Lord. Okay. Man, I got to read 21. I'll just, I'll finish this out. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. That means you're always going to remember the Bible. Sister Bernice Whitehead remembered the Bible when I went to visit her. She didn't know who I was, but she knew the Bible verses. My grandma knew all the verses to Amazing Grace, Old Rugged Cross, and Rock of Ages cleft for me. She sung every one of them with us. You remember that, Matthew? That was so sweet to me. I needed that. But notice all these verses where the Bible says that the enemy's coming like a flood. The enemy's the flood, okay? Jeremiah 46, 7. Who is this that cometh up as a flood, whose waters are moved as with the rivers? Egypt riseth up, notice the wording, riseth up like a flood, and its waters are moved like the rivers. And he saith, I will go up and cover the earth, and I will destroy the city and the inhabitants thereof. Look what he said, I'll go and cover the earth. There's a flood coming. It's not water. It's wicked people and devils. Be in the ark when that happens jeremiah 47 thus saith the lord behold waters rise up out of the north think about it and shall be are there waters up in the north pole that's all there is right what form what they say what what if that melts good but I have to think not. God said it wouldn't be water, water. So there shall be an overwhelming flood and shall overflow the land and all that is therein and the city and them that dwell therein that the men shall cry and all the inhabitants of the land shall howl. Turn to Matthew 7. Turn to Matthew 7. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. Scene, Jaden. The wise man built his house upon the rock and the rains came tumbling down. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up and the house on the rock stood firm. I love it. Matthew 7. So, you know, imagine me, if you would, I'm sitting there and I'm pondering floods. I, I was raised in Sunday school. Raised on a bus ministry. Knew all these songs. And I'm sitting there pondering that and I'm just going, oh. why did he say a flood? Why did he say that? I wonder if it's related to Noah and prophecy. And it is. Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth this, these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came. There it is. And the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not. For it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not, should be likened unto a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, 
and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Wise and foolish people. The wise are going to make it. The foolish are not. Amen. Uh, Isaiah 54, very quickly, I want to touch on this. Beautiful chapter, Isaiah 54. Beautiful, beautiful chapter. A lot of redemption in this chapter. So think of women in the Bible that could not have a child. Did God give them a child? Every one of them. Isaiah 54, single, barren, thou that didst not bear. Think of Israel. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Even when you have a man with two wives, like Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar, or um, Jacob with Rachel and Leah, or um, Elkanah with Hannah and Peninnah, you have one wife that's favored and loved, but childless. You have another wife that's not so loved, but fruitful. Okay? And that's a picture of the Gentiles, picture of Israel. So he said in verse 2, Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. In other words, build on. You're going to need more rooms. Right, Matthew? Yep, need more rooms. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make desolate. See, telling you it's Israel. And make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither that be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. I'd love, Roy, to not remember my youth. Okay, for thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth shall he be called. That's Jesus. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit and a wife of youth when thou wast refused, saith thy God, for a small moment. Have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. Woo! In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. Verse 9, this is as the waters of Noah unto me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. For the mountains shall depart, and the hills shall be removed. That's in other places in the Bible. That, I believe that's going to happen. And it's going to be so cool, too. Every mountain, every valley. Those are Hebrew words, too, by the way. That's how it's spelled, okay? Uh, but my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that hath mercy on thee. I think if we could tell anybody anything as a church about our church, hey, won't you come and find out that God can have mercy on the worst sinners? He did it for us. Amen. Amen. So that, to me, and there's a whole lot more in the Bible. It's any place you see water. And the water is used almost in every story in the Bible. You're going to find water of some kind. It's awesome when you think about it. Water, seas, lakes, rivers, streams, you name it. Rain, dew, frost, snow things that happened by a lake, things that happened by a river. I mean, where did some of these prophecies, where, where, was, uh, where was Daniel? It was by the river Uli. Where was Ezekiel? It said by a river. Okay, all these guys by a river. John the Baptist down at the river Jordan. All of it, typology, I think, of what's coming. Because he's going to save us through the water times. 
But I don't think it's water. I think it's fire. I think it's fire. Yeah, it does. What's false prophet going to bring down? Fire. And so you've got all these false prophets on TV calling down fire from heaven. Literally saying, God, send the fire down. Crazy. Crazy stuff. All right, let's go to prayer. A lot there. Study, study, study. Learn, learn, learn. Read, read, read. He said, I don't understand it when I read. Wait a month. It'll show up. Or a year. It'll show up. Just out of the blue, you'll go, oh, that's what that means. Whoa. Yeah, it is. Father, help us to learn, study, read, memorize. Just bury us, Father, in Scripture. So that, Father, when we read other Scriptures, it makes sense. We remember. The Holy Ghost draw it out of us. Pull verses that we read a year ago that we forgot. Pull verses out like we just read them. Father, you are always with your people when they read this book. In this book, you know it, God, is the roadmap for tomorrow. It's got everything in it that we will need to make it through some pretty rough days. Now, Father, I'm just weak enough as I get older to get scared by things pretty easily. So, Father, I always ask you, God, make me not afraid on that day. Make me not afraid on that day. Put me in the ark, and then I'll know I'm safe. Blessed be the name of the Lord, we pray. And blessed be your word above your name, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, amen. amen.